Praise the Lord. Welcome to our Tuesday Leaders Development tonight. And I pray that the teaching tonight will not only enlighten you or encourage you, it will strengthen you in the ministry and the work the Lord has given to us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your people, your servants, our ministers. Thank you, Lord, for the great work you've given everyone to do. And we pray, Lord, we will not fail in this work that you have given us to do in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you open the pages of the scriptures to every one of us. And we'll not just be learners, we'll be doers of the word in Jesus' name. All the grace we need, all the light we need, all the encouragement we need, all the power we need, you grant unto everyone by the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you know, we're now in the book of Revelation. And we're looking at the letters and the epistles written by John from Christ, the head of the church, unto the uh, church. And he's writing actually to ministers of the church. And as you look at these uh, seven epistles and seven letters written from Christ through John the Beloved, you will understand, number one, there is a primary association. That means that the head of the church is writing to these particular churches and to the church of Ephesus, right, to the minister, the pastor, the shepherd, and the angel of uh, the church in Smyrna, right, there's a primary association. That is the primary people that the Lord wrote to. And then there's a personal application. For you, for me, and for everyone, we apply the word to ourselves. It's just like you read anywhere in Genesis, there's a personal application. Anything you are reading in Joshua, there's a personal application. And anything now that you are reading in Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, the letters, the epistles, and the messages of Christ, unto the leaders, unto the ministers of the church, it has a personal application to every minister and every member and then also it has a prophetic anticipation we're looking forward to the coming of christ in fact the lord jesus christ spoke about his coming in these letters he said repent or else i will come and remove the candlestick out of its place except you repent and you're also writing to the churches he said you hold fast what you have that no man take your crown he say see that keep it my works to the end the same you will give uh, the reward so there's a prophetic anticipation number one a primary association connected with the churches that he wrote to directly number two a personal application and number three a prophetic anticipation we're now coming to revelation chapter two and we're reading from verse eight it says unto the angel of the church in smana right unto the angel unto the minister unto the bishop unto the leader of the church in this particular city right this six says the first and the last the lord jesus christ is introducing himself he says which was dead we know about that was crucified he died he was buried he rose again and is alive that's about his resurrection and is alive forevermore look at verse 9 it says in verse 9 i know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. It tells us in verse 10, it says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried there's a trial of the believer, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, 
a short time, a brief time, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And then he tells us in verse 11, he says, For he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh, he that overcometh, he wants us to understand there's something to overcome. And he wants us to make up our mind, we are going to be overcomers. And he says, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. That's the letter that he wrote to the minister. And that has application to you, to me, and to all the members, every member of the church. Like this minister, the angel of the church, his manner, like this minister, the bishop, the pastor, the leader, the shepherd of the church, or in his manner, persecuted but not overpowered you see there may be persecution but we are not overpowered and the lord will moderate the persecution and the temptation he will not allow you to be tempted more than you are able understand that whatever comes you will overcome you can overcome you must overcome you will make a way of escape that she may be able to bear it but you know like this minister like this, uh, like this, a shepherd of the church in Smyrna, every one of us as a minister, whether we're ministering to the youths or the campus, or we're ministering to the children, every one of us as a minister, whether you're ministering to the women, or you're ministering to the whole church as an overseer, as a leader, we must remain purposeful. You see, that's the, that's the quality of this a minister in the church in Smyrna. Persecution came, suffering came, the winds blew and the, they were vehement. But all the same, he remained purposeful and he was prayerful. You can tell because that's how he had the power to overcome. He was peaceful. There was no fighting. There was no strife. There was no commotion and there was no conflict at all. When you are purposeful, you'll be peaceful. You will not leave your purpose and leave the direction you ought to be going and then begin a local fight no and when you are prayerful you have left everything in the hands of god you're going to be peaceful and remain pure because my brother my sister you understand whatever will suffer if there's no purity blessed at the pure in heart for they shall see god whatever we go through however we serve if we don't remain a pure how are we going to make it on the final day not only that was pure it was powerful you shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me for the minister and the pastor and the shepherd the angel in the church in manner for him to remain purposeful and prayerful and peaceful and pure purified he must be powerful actually you know in the early church everyone received the holy ghost from acts chapter 2 you come to the end of that chapter it says the gift is unto you and to your children and as they went on they didn't allow anybody to you know just go on i'm saved i'm sanctified they led them to the experience of the baptism in the holy ghost that's what you find in chapter 19 of acts of the apostles have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Since you believe, you are now a child of God and now you become a minister. What qualification do we have? We must have been saved, we must have been sanctified, and we must have received the power of the Holy Ghost. And then this minister, like you and I must be, was passionate passionate they had their enthusiasm their excitement and they had their heart in what they were doing they were not dull and they were not uh, kind of lukewarm and then they are always tired and always weak no they were passionate and they were compelled they were driven by the force of the power of the holy ghost and they were productive productive that's very important that we understand that as the lord has called us he wants us to be poor purposeful he wants us to be productive and they were persevering persecution was there they said i'll go another day i'll go another week i'll go another month i'll go another year if jesus tarries despite persecution 
those ministers of old, not only the minister in the church in Smyrna, all those ministers, they remain purposeful. The Lord is calling you and I, and that we re-examine re our purpose again, purposeful, prayerful, peaceful, pure and purified, powerful, passionate, productive, and persevering, whatever suffering and whatever persecution we may face. Tonight, we're looking at uh, this message, the promised preservation of the persecuted. The promised preservation of the persecuted. We've read the passage already. We're dividing the message tonight to three parts. Number one is the foundation and the fortress of commissioned servants. The Lord Jesus Christ introduced himself. And you know he's the foundation. is the fortress of commissioned servants. Point number two, the fearlessness and the faithfulness of Christian soldiers. You know, we cannot, you know, say that too often in enough because you know if the devil discovers in our heart that we are fearful of him if society discovers that although we're in that village although we're in that town although we're in that area of the community we're fearful and we're always dropping our head we don't know what is going to come we don't know what they are going to throw at us and we do not know our birthright and we do not know our redemptive right we do not know our commissioned right the right we have as the commissioned soldiers of the cross if we do not know that and we go through life fearful and then we're depressed, we're oppressed, we're discouraged, we're thinking when with all this age they will trample on us but we have the fearlessness and the faithfulness of Christian soldiers. A soldier that goes into a territory and is to either recover that territory for his, uh, for his uh, country or is to protect that territory for his country. It must be fearless as well as faithful. That's what the Lord has called us to. Point number two is the fearlessness and the faithfulness of Christian soldiers. Point number three the factors in the fortitude of conquering saints. The saints who conquer. What are the factors? What are the elements? What are the various items that make the Christian saints and the conquering saints to have the fortitude and the courage and the stamina and the backbone to overcome all the time? That's point number three. The factors in the fortitude of conquering saints. We're coming to point number one now. In point number one, we're looking at uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8, it says unto the angel of the church is manna right these things says the first and the last which was dead and is alive again he was dead and now he is alive you see here three things number one the first and the last the eternal the first and the last the eternal as the lord jesus christ introduced himself he actually uh, brought uh, some of the qualities and some of the titles in chapter 1 revelation chapter 1 look at verse 8 it says in revelation chapter 1 and it tells us in verse 8 it says i am alpha and omega this is christ this is our savior this is the one that commissioned us he says nothing before him nothing after him i am alpha and omega the beginning and the ending says the lord which is and which was and which is to come the almighty look at verse 11 in verse 11 it says saying i am alpha and omega he repeats that again for emphasis the first and the last the first and the last and you know as he goes on talking about himself christ our savior it says in verse 17 in verse 17 it says and when i saw him john said when i saw him when i saw the one that commissioned me the one that died for me on the cross of calvary the one that i rested my head on his bosom 
is totally different now because he's gone to glory. And he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me. If that right hand comes upon you, you will never be weak again. When that right hand comes upon you, you'll be strong from the inner man. When that right hand, uh, when it comes upon you, and it says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Go ye therefore and teach all nations whatsoever I've commanded you. I am with you. I am with you until the end of the world. And that right hand comes upon you. Anytime you are weak, that right hand will strengthen you. Anytime you are down, that right hand will come upon you. It will strengthen you, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. It says, This is the reason you will not fear. I am the first and the last. Look at verse 18. It says in verse 18, I am he that liveth. And was dead. I am in the present and I live in the present. In the past, I was dead. And he says, And behold, I am alive forevermore. It's for you there. I am alive forevermore. You need him. I am alive forevermore. You want him to take care of you and put that mighty hand upon you. I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. He has the keys of death and of hell. And look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, we're looking at verse 12. It's telling us, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega. Let me remind you in chapter 1, I am Alpha and Omega. He said in chapter 2, I am Alpha and Omega. That's what he said. And now at the end of the book of Revelation, he has not changed. He remains ever the same. All the things that will happen uh, during the church age in chapters 2 and 3, he remains Alpha and Omega. All the things that will happen from chapter 4 to chapter 5 when the throne is exalted and then you have the elders worshipping the Lord, he is still Alpha and Omega. All the things that will happen from chapter 6 and the time of the great tribulation all through to the end when Satan will be bound is still the alpha and the omega and then all through the millennial reign is still going to be the alpha and the omega and when it comes to the end and is to establish his eternal kingdom is still the alpha and the omega it says i'm alpha and omega the beginning and the end the first and the last is the eternal one and let's look at this is also number two now the foundation and the lodge of everyone when you say some alpha and omega there's no other foundation there's no other savior there's no other redeemer and we're looking at section two now of this point number one the foundation and the lodge of everyone in first corinthians chapter three first corinthians chapter three verse 10 it says as a wise master builder according to the grace of god which is given unto me as a wise master builder i have laid the foundation and another builders thereon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon what did Paul mean by that? Who is the foundation? The foundation of our faith for everyone. If you are going to have faith in God and you are going to have salvation in Christ, he is the foundation. Look at verse 11. It says, for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, he is the foundation. He is the foundation. And then we're told in Isaiah chapter 28, what the almighty God himself, what he said in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16, it says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Look at that. You want to have assurance that no matter what happens, no matter the wind, no matter the trial, no matter the temptation, no matter the tribulation, that you will get to heaven. Here is the foundation. It's the first and it's the last. It's the foundation and it is the Lord for everyone. It says it's a sure foundation. 
He that believeth shall not make haste. He that believeth shall not make haste. He wants you to make up your mind. I know you're a minister, but he wants you to make up your mind that whatever comes, whatever goes, you believe in the Lord and you keep on believing. You keep on believing. When sickness comes, you believe. He that believeth. When trial comes, you believe. He that believeth. When something comes, you don't understand. You must remember that the Lord who is your liberator and the Lord who is your foundation, he says, I know. You don't know, but he says, I know. Something is happening, you can't understand. He says, I understand. And when you believe in him like that to the very end, you will not make haste. The Lord will be what you look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. I will read him from verse 9. In Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at uh, verse 9. It says, wherefore God also has highly exalted him. He's talking about the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has given him a name which is above every name. He has given Christ the first and the last a name which is above every name. He has given Christ the Alpha and the Omega a name which is above every name. Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10 that at the name of Jesus every name every knee is the foundation and the lord of everyone those uh, who accept him uh, and those who receive him uh, and those who give their lives to him uh, and those who look at calvary and they look at the sacrifice that he made and they put their confidence in him he that believeth in him shall not be confounded he that believeth in him shall not be his he that believeth in him shall not be disappointed when they do it voluntarily now is their Lord if they don't do it voluntarily at the end after they die without Christ and without salvation he will still be the Lord of everyone that had the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and then it says in verse 11 in verse 11 and that every tongue should confess every tongue should confess that's why we say it's the foundation and is the lord of everyone that everyone should confess that jesus christ is lord that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Well then, as the Lord Jesus Christ introduced himself, the first and the last is the eternal. He introduced himself is the foundation and the Lord of everyone. Look at section three now. He is the fortress and the liberator without equal. There's nobody to compare Jesus Christ with of all the prophets of the, of the Old Testament. There's nobody to compare him with. He's without equal of all the apostles, of all the men in the New Testament. There's nobody to compare Jesus Christ with. He's the liberator without equal of all the men that have ever lived in history. And of all the men that may live today, and that may live, may keep on living until Christ comes, there is no equal. He is the fortress, and he is the liberator without equal. And let's come to Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 18, we're looking at verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is our strength. Are you weak? The Lord is your strength. Are you sorrowful? The Lord is your strength. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength and the power within you. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, the Lord is my rock. You remember the rock of ages cry for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from your wounded dream inside the flood be of sin the double cure. He is our rock and is my fortress. The Lord Jesus Christ is that mighty tower and the righteous runneth into it and is saved. He is my deliverer. He delivered in the past. He's delivering now. He will keep on delivering. He is my God. He is my strength in whom I will trust. 
in whom I will trust. In the day, I trust him. In the night, I trust him. Every time, every moment, I trust him. You will never be disappointed in Jesus' name. In whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower and my high tower. Whatever storm and whatever difficulty and whatever danger is by your side there is the high tower, your very high tower, run into him and you're safe and you're secured and you're preserved because he is the fortress and the liberator without equal. And look at verse 35. In verse 35 it says, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. You know, when we're born again, well, it's not just I'm born again and life continues as usual. I'm born again, I'm as weak as ever. I'm born again, I'm as downtrodden as ever. I am born again, I'm as powerless as ever. No, it says the Lord has given me. The Alpha and the Omega has given me. My Lord has given me. My Savior has given me. He says, the one that died and he rose again for my justification, he has given me the shield of his salvation. Remember when you come to the Old Testament, it says, and you have the shield of salvation and thy right hand as holding me up. That's the right hand again. You remember the right hand came upon John, the beloved. He was strengthened. He was energized. And now he says, thy right hand as holding me up up and thy gentleness has made me great thy gentleness has made me great you must remember the lord jesus christ is lowly and is meek and they took him and they arrested him and they took him from trial to trial and he opened not his mouth that quietness that is uh, referring to his lowliness and gentleness has now made us great has taken us out of the dungeon of sin has brought us to the mountain top of the light of the gospel that gentleness has made me great let's come to jeremiah chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 19 jeremiah chapter 16 verse 19 oh lord my strength and my fortress if you remember jeremiah uh, you know theologians call him the weeping prophet he had quite a lot of pressure and quite a lot of persecution and quite a lot of suffering but here comes jeremiah he said but i went through and I got through and I remain steadfast in the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is my strength. Because the Lord is my fortress. Because the Lord is my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Look at verse 21. It says in verse 21, it says, Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know mine hand and my might. You know, he has chosen you, you're a child of God. Not only that, you're a son, a daughter of God. Not only that, you're a servant of the Lord. And he made you to be a minister, the angel in the church in, you can put the name of your city there, you are not in manner now, in your own city, and his right hand is there with you. He will make you to know his hand and his mind, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. My name is the conqueror. My name is the all in all. They will know that my name is the Lord, the one that has the final say. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. We're looking at verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9. Looking at verse 6 and it says, for unto us a child is born unto us. I know you know the verse but for you to think unto me because of me. If you were the only sinner in the world, if you were the only person that needs redemption in the world, Christ will still have been given. And for you to say, unto us a child is born, unto me a child is born, unto us a son is given, unto me a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. 
counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. As we look at the titles of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be living a wicked life, a downtrodden life, a discouraged life, a powerless life. We should wake up and understand who our Savior is, who our sanctifier is, who our Lord is, that he is the Prince of Peace, is the Father of eternity. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7 of the increase of his kingdom, and peace there shall be no end. And it says, upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. From henceforth even forever. All that Jesus did continues to be effective even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this in our lives. Look at Isaiah chapter 46, reading from verse 9. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. Underline that. There is none else. The heavenly Father is without equal. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who says I'm Alpha and Omega, who says I'm the first and the last, who says I was dead, I'm alive again, is also without equal. And there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. He is the fortress. He is the liberator without equal. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it says, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. Do you remember? Heaven and I shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. My counsel shall stand. That is, whatever he purposed, Whatever he planned for the whole universe, for all the generations, and for all the dispensations, and now narrow it down for your life, for your ministry, for your family, it says, my counsel shall stand. The Alpha and the Omega, the one that was dead and now is alive. The one that is alive forevermore. The Lord and the liberator. Your savior and sanctifier. And your strength and your fortress. It says, my counsel shall stand. In the church, his counsel will stand. In your life, his counsel will stand. On your family, his counsel shall stand. Go back to the world and go and see what's his counsel. What's his word. What's his decision? And what is the prophetic utterance he has uh, prophesied concerning you and concerning the church? My counsel shall stand when he says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I will do all my pleasure. Well, then uh, we have seen the foundation and the fortress of commissioned servants. We're coming to point number two now. In point number two, we're reading Revelation chapter two. And we're looking at it from verse nine to verse 10. Revelation chapter two, we're reading from verse nine. I know thy works, that's comforting. People may not know your works, I know your works. People may not know your value, I know your value. People may not know your activities. They say, and so and so says it's an overseer, and so and so says it's, you know, a pastor, so and so is a minister. By the way, what does he even do? We're not hearing about him. Don't worry about that. I know thy works and tribulation. And poverty. Look at this. I know that tribulation, but I'm still talking to you. You're still alive. The tribulation did not swallow you up. The tribulation did not, uh, you know, cancel all your strength and destroy your stamina. I know thy words. I know thy tribulation and thy poverty. Look at the bracket there. But thou art rich. You understand? I know your poverty externally. But internally, this is what I know. 
I know that thou art rich. I know you are rich in grace. I know you are rich in godliness. I know you are rich in the goodness of God. I know you are rich, the riches of glory, they abide in your life. But thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. But at the synagogue of Satan, look at verse 10, it says in verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, Ten days, ten days, what does that mean? It's temporary. It's going to be brief. It's not a long time. It's not an indefinite time. Just ten days. You remember when Daniel said unto the head of the eunuchs, try us only ten days with only pearls and water, with only vegetables and water, and see what will happen. Just a brief time. That's not a long time. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, until death, and I will give thee a crown of life. I want you to look at something. This verse, at the beginning, fear none of those things. Be fearless. And at the end, be faithful, be thou faithful unto death. Let's, let's put that in two perspectives. Number one, fear none of these things. Fear none of these things. Number two, be thou faithful. Look at number one, when it says fear none of these things. What did he mean by that? Number one, fear not the suffering for sacrificial service. As you look at that, it says fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. You're serving the Lord sacrificially and you are suffering for that it says don't fear that don't fear the suffering of sacrificial service look at first peter chapter 3 in first peter chapter 3 we're reading from verse 14 first peter chapter 3 verse 14 but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake my brother don't forget that i'm righteous why am i still suffering because people don't understand righteousness I'm righteous, and why do I still have persecution? Because most people don't understand righteousness. What we count as righteousness, what Christ counts as righteousness, what the Bible reveals as righteousness, they just, so, they just think it's a peculiar character. They just think it's eccentric. They just think it's queer. They just think it's not, it doesn't fit into the world of today. And because of that, because of their misunderstanding of sacrificial service and of righteousness and of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, that's why you suffer. And it says, but, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, Happy are ye. You don't cry. You don't weep. You don't even internally, privately, in your little corner or your big corner, you don't drop your head and say, Why me? Why is this happening? Be happy. Because you are identified with Christ. Happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror. Be not afraid of their terror. When you tell yourself, This is terrible can somebody go through this how can somebody endure this this is terror it says be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled look at verse 15 it says in verse 15 but sanctify the lord god in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear take the suffering you know as an opportunity to declare more of the truth of God, that you are ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Look at verse 16. It says in verse 16, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation 
in Christ. And then he tells us in verse 17, in verse 17 he says, For it is better if the will of God be so. Always pray the will of God be done. If there is a persecution, the will of God be done. But you know, we don't pray like that. We say, Lord, take the persecution away. Just say, the will of God be done. We say, let's see the persecution. Don't pray like that. The will of God be done. I cannot bear this. How can I go through this? Don't pray like that. The will of God be done. He will moderate everything. He allows that thing. You know, and if he allows it for a purpose, let the purpose for which the Lord allowed, the suffering for sacrificial service, let the purpose be fulfilled for it is better if the will of God be so that he suffer for well doing than for evil doing look at verse 18 in verse 18 it says for Christ also as one suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit the lord jesus said to that angel of the church in manner fear none of those things when thou shalt suffer what are they number two is the blasphemy of the boosters the blasphemy of the boosters if you come back to revelation chapter 2 and you're reading from verse 9 revelation chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 9 i know thy words and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich look at this and i know the blasphemy of them which say they are jews and are not but they are of the synagogue of satan because of uh, wanting to uh, irritate you annoy you and then depress you they blaspheme the name of the lord that that causes suffering you understand that kind of emotional suffering when somebody insults your father when somebody insults your husband when somebody insults your wife when somebody insults uh, your your maker when somebody insults your savior and when they blaspheme against the name of the lord that to cherish him so much it's like a dagger in your heart it says don't allow that emotional suffering don't allow that um, um, psychological suffering, the blasphemy of the boasters. Because this is what will happen in the last days. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This know also that in the last days, pray lost time shall come. Look at verse 2. It says, Because for men shall be lovers of their own selves, Look at these covetous, boosters, proud, blasphemers. The Lord said it will happen. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. When you take a stand, and when you take stand for righteousness and for holiness, you might suffer for that. They might begin to pass a negative comments about you, about your Christ, about your salvation, about the Bible, about the doctrines of the Bible, and they boast and they say, I hope he doesn't come near me. I hope he doesn't bring that their message of, uh, you know, the only way and the only religion, the narrow way that leads to heaven. I hope he doesn't come near me to bring that and then they blaspheme don't allow that to push you back and don't allow that to depress you and oppress you if you come to revelation chapter 2 and verse 9 revelation chapter 2 verse 9 again is saying be not afraid of this the synagogue of satan the synagogue of satan it says i know thy words and thy tribulation and thy poverty but thou art rich and i know the blasphemy of them which say they are jews and are not but look at this look at this but are present tense but are the synagogue of satan that is uh, uh, the, the factory of Satan. That is the manufacturing uh, uh, stand uh, or factory of Satan. Why manufactures its lies and its evil. 
where he demonstrates the powers of darkness, where he calls people and he says, well, and they say Jesus can do this and Jesus can do that. And they will have the false signs and the lying wonders, the synagogue of Satan. He says, don't allow that to oppress you or to confuse you or to make you afraid. If they are doing that in the synagogue of Satan, what can we show that we're more powerful than them? You're not competing with them. You're just doing the work the Lord has given you to do. Don't rush into anything. Don't plunge into anything because you are hearing news from the synagogue of Satan that this is going on and that is going on. Look at chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. In Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 9, Behold, I will make them underline that i will make them of the synagogue of satan which say they are jews they are religious but they are not righteous which say they are jews and are not but do lie behold i will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that i have loved thee well then you are an overcomer you're going to overcome all the agents from the synagogue of Satan. You're going to overcome all the cohorts from the synagogue of Satan. If you are the overcomer, if you are going to overcome, why will you fear any of these things? Look at Romans chapter 16, and we're reading from verse, we're reading from verse 20. Romans chapter 16, we're reading from verse 20. It tells us in verse 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan with all his synagogue, shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. You know, there are people that whenever they want to talk and they're going to mention Satan, they cover their mouth. Don't allow Satan to hear this one. Whenever they're going to talk and they're going to mention all the atrocities and the lying wonders from the synagogue of Satan, they cover their mouth. They're afraid. And that's exactly what the Lord said. Be not afraid. He says, fear none of these things. Fear not, number one, the suffering you might have for sacrificial service. Fear not, number two, the blasphemy of the boasters. Fear not, number three, the synagogue of Satan. Because God, the God of peace, shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Can you say amen? He will do it in Jesus' name and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Number four, it says, fear not the persecution in the prison. Persecution in the prison. Already he told us ahead of time in Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 12. Luke chapter 21, and we're reading from verse 12. It says, before all these, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. You see the word there, they shall persecute you, persecution. And then you see the word there, into prison. And so when these things happen, don't let them take you by surprise. In fact, Paul and Silas, when he got to the prison, they were not surprised. Why me? Why us? Why should this happen? We examine our lives. We examine our ministry. We examine our hearts. We examine our sincerity. We examine our transparency. We examine our faithfulness. And we cannot find any way in any part of the work we are at fault, and yet we're in the prison. No, they were not unhappy. They were not sorrowful. Look at their action in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 25. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 25. And it says, and at midnight, the midnight, when the lights are all gone, and then in the dead of the night, and uh, it's not that they couldn't sleep. Understand that. There are some people, they have a little headache and they can't sleep. They make themselves sleepless. 
they have a little challenge and a little bad news that came from the village they make themselves sleepless and they have a little a little thing they can't understand us at now why this is happening and they make themselves sleepless no Paul and Silas were not sleepless they kept themselves awake because they were going to pray because they were going to praise the Lord and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners had them they were not mourning they were not crying they were not weeping they were praying and singing praises to God in verse 26 it says and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison look at that the foundations of the prison were shaking and immediately all the doors were open all your doors will be open let me hear your amen and everyone's bands were loose any bound on your wife any bounds on your on your children any bounds on yourself as you sing unto the lord and praise the name of the lord in the day and in the night it says everyone's bounds were loose brothers and sisters do you ever sing outside the church you know there are some people only at the time of church service they sing only at the time of congregational singing, they sing. Only at the time when we're all together corporately, they sing. You sing when you're by yourself in the bathroom, do you sing? In your sitting room, living room, do you sing? In the kitchen, cooking, do you sing? And in the midnight, do you sing? When there's a doctor's report that days and days is wrong, do you sing? You know, if we sing more, we'll see more signs and wonders. Paul and Silas sang. They didn't mind the prison. And then it says, you are not to be afraid of temporary trial and tribulation. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, These things have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In Christ ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Don't be downtrodden because of that. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he overcame the world for you on your behalf. And because of that it says be cheerful and be happy and be joyful all the time and the joy of the lord will be your strength in jesus name i told you let's come back to revelation chapter 2 now in revelation chapter 2 we're looking at verses 9 and 10 it says in verse 9 it says i know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich you're rich in grace thou art rich you're rich in his goodness thou art rich you're rich in godliness thou art rich are rich unto his glory he is rich in glory and is blessing you and i know the blasphemy of them which say they are jews and are not but at the synagogue of satan then in verse 10 it says fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days but be thou faithful unto death and i will give thee a crown of life be thou faithful unto death and uh, i will give thee a crown of life we have the two sides of a coin one side is fear not the other side of the coin is be faithful if you do not fear but at the same time you are not looking at the other side of the coin uh, that's not complete you must have the one side fear none of these things and the second side of the coin be faithful unto death until death uh, what are we to be faithful to number one we're to be as faithful as devoted disciples be faithful as devoted disciples in first corinthians chapter four first corinthians chapter four reading from verse one let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ 
and as stewards of the mysteries of God. Let a man so account of us, he's talking about you, as the, of the ministers of Christ. You know what it says? Carry yourself as a minister of Christ. Your comportment, your stature, your standing, your language, your character, your outward appearance, and your presentation. Anytime, anywhere you are, understand, you are a minister of Christ. Carry yourself in such a way. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of God. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, that a woman be found faithful as a devoted disciple of Christ. You are faithful in little things. You are faithful in much. Number two, faithful in doctrine. When it says we need to be faithful and we're faithful, we must be faithful until this. Number two, faithful in doctrine. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 verse 9. It's saying holding forth the watch of life. Holding forth the faithful watch as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. It says we're faithful in our faithfulness, we're faithful to the word, the word of Christ and the word of the Lord by sound doctrine. Look at chapter 2 of Titus, Titus chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 7. It says in verse 7, in all things showing thyself a good pattern your minister in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works as a husband show yourself as a pattern to the whole church as a wife show yourself a good pattern to the whole church as a widow and a widower who is a minister a child of god a minister of god you show yourself as a pattern of good works as a single man you are not married yet but you're a minister you show yourself a pattern of good works as a spinster that is a lady a sister not married yet but you are a minister of god and you're ministering this section or that section you show yourself a pattern of good works let people see you and read the bible in your character and read the Bible in your conduct. And then it says, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. You are not flippant. You are not frivolous. You are not careless. You are not light. And you are not, um, what I mean is, you are not so light. You don't carry any weight. You must carry some weight. Your words must carry some weight. Your life must carry some weight. In doctrine, show no corruptness, gravity, sincerity. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Look at First Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. In First Timothy chapter 4, we're looking at verse 15. It says in verse 15, meditate upon these things, all these things that we're hearing, that you must be fearless, and in all the areas you must be fearless, that we must be faithful. In all the areas we want to be faithful, meditate upon these things. Give thyself holy to them. Don't give yourself partially, half-heartedly, superficially. Give yourself wholeheartedly. Give yourself holy to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Your profit in ministry, your progress in ministry, and uh, the increase in the work of God in your hand. And then in verse 16, uh, in verse 16 it says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. That's where it wants us to be faithful. You are faithful as a devoted disciple and you are faithful in doctrine. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Number three now is to be faithful 
without delay or deficiency. Be faithful without delay. You know what that means? It's in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 45. Matthew chapter 24, verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household? Look at this. To give them meat in due season. No delay. To give them meat in due season. How to feed the family of God. But I'm not ready yet. Why not? How to feed the babes. But I'm not doing it now. Why not? How to feed the hungry. But I'm not doing it now. Why not? There must be no delay to give them meat in due season. At the right time. And then in verse 46, it says, Blessed, happy, fortunate is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing, doing the right thing at the right time, feeding the lambs and feeding the sheep and feeding the flock and doing it without delay and doing it without deficiency. You know what that means? Give the church a balanced diet. Talk about faith. Talk about healing. Balance it up. Talk about holiness. Talk about righteousness. Talk about the present day. Balance it up. Talk about the future. Talk about sins forgiven. Balance it up. Talk about freedom from sin. We're giving them balanced diet in due season. The right time and the right thing that we give them. And then we're faithful in all details. We're faithful in all details. Come to Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 5, Hebrews chapter 3, we're looking at verse 5. It says, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. He was faithful in every detail. If you go back to Exodus, there's no time to read that now from chapter 25 all through to chapter 40 and you'll see especially chapter starting 9 and 40 how it says concerning this he did everything as the Lord commanded him. A few verses after as the Lord commanded him. A few verses after as the Lord commanded him. We're faithful in all details. Look at chapter 8 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8, we're looking at verse 5. And it says there in verse 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished, commanded of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle for sea, says he that thou make all things all things according to the pattern should to thee in the mount that's the faithfulness you are faithful in all details and now we come back to revelation chapter 2 verse 10 revelation chapter 2 verse 10 you are faithful until death you are faithful until death you know my brother if there's any time to slow down not today, not today. We are nearer the end than 10 years ago. We are nearer the end than 20 years ago. You were faithful 30 years ago, and now you want to slow down. It's not the time to slow down because we're nearer the end now. We must be faithful until the rapture, until the end, until death. That's why it says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried, and he shall have tribulation ten days temporary. And be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. The people who know the Lord and the people who serve the Lord, they're faithful. It says, thee shall make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them. Understand that? Whatever comes, whatever goes, the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. They that are with him 
at that time when it comes to conquer the antichrist they that are with him who are those those were the people that made it at the time of the rapture and they went to be with the lord they were absent from earth during the time of the great tribulation they were in heaven with christ at the end of the great tribulation christ comes that's the second coming of christ when he comes in glory and he comes with the angels and he comes with thousands and thousands ten thousand and ten thousand of his saints and then he comes with them and those saints that are within when he comes again they are the called and the chosen and the faithful they were faithful until death they were faithful until the end and so now they will be forever conquerors overcomers with the lord we're coming to point number three now in point number three What's the fortitude? What's the power that makes these people faithful, fearless, forthright, and they have the strength of the Lord to move on until the end? We're looking at the factors in the fortitude of conquering sins. We're coming to Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Look at this, he's saying he, not they that have ears to hear. Let them hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. The Spirit of God speaks to the whole church, to all the churches, the whole church, the church in Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, the church in Pergamum, the church in Tyre, the church in Sardis, and the church in Philadelphia, and the church in Laodicea. It speaks to all the churches. And then each individual, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. How do we know that we have an ear? You have an ear. I have an ear to hear. Number one, obeying the word after hearing. That's the evidence. I have ears to hear, and I've heard, and I believe, and I accept, and I obey. Obeying the word after hearing. And look at this. It tells us in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and we're looking at verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 24, it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, that's the one that has an ear to hear. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. In verse 25, it says, And the rain descended, and the floods came. Hold on. When you built your house upon the rock, and you see the cloud, and torrential rain is going to pour down, you're not afraid. The foundation is solid. The walls are well built and the roof is firm. You're not afraid. But if every time rain is going to come, you're afraid of the building. Something is wrong. Every time temptation is coming, trial is coming, suffering is coming, persecution is coming, every time opposition is coming, you're afraid and you're panicking. Something is wrong. When you build your spiritual house, the house of your Christian life and the house of your Christian ministry upon the foundation of the rock, the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. I pray that will be your kind of spiritual house. Look at James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, reading from verse 22. James chapter 1, reading from verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, 
not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Be ye doers of the word. Those are the people that have ears to hear. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it tells us, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Those are the people that have ears to hear. They are doers of the word, and they shall be blessed indeed. The Lord will continue to bless you, bless me, bless us, as we have ears to hear, and we demonstrate by obeying the word we have heard. Number two, overcoming the world through holiness. We're coming to Revelation chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 2, we're reading from the second part of verse 11. It says, He that overcometh, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. He that overcometh. What's that? You overcome the flesh. What's that? They overcome the world. What's that? They overcome the temptations of the devil. What's that? They overcome all the practices, sinful, defiling practices of society. He that overcomes. Do you see that word overcome? It's not just he that overcame. There are some people, 40 years ago when they became Christians, they were mighty overcomers. 20 years ago, when they became pastors and preachers and ministers, they were tremendous, triumphant overcomers. But today, their shoulders are down. Their backbone is weak. Their conviction is eroded. They cannot overcome today. Even little simple thoughts that come to them, the persecution has not come. The suffering has not come. It's just a thought. What if this happens already? They're trembling. But if we keep on overcoming, he that overcomes, if he gave us grace 30 years ago to overcome, is still the same Christ, the same I am that I am, and the same Alpha and Omega. And the same one that was dead and is alive again. And the same one that has overcome. And he still has that conquering power. If he was with us 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, he's still with us today. And that same power that made us overcome at that time, that same power is still there today. You will keep on overcoming in Jesus' name. My brother, my sister, if you are down, get up and awake and dust yourself from all the doors that came upon you and shake yourself from the doors and stand firmly and stand squarely understanding that the grace of God cannot fail in your life. My grace is sufficient for you. That holiness will continue until the very end. He that overcomes present tense, continuous present tense, shall not be hurt of the second death. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 1. It says, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. That's what I said. Wake up and shake yourself from the dust and all that kind of weakness and defilement that wants to attach itself around your waist, around your body, around your mind. Shake everything up and let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Look at this, perfecting holiness, perfecting holiness, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That is, the holiness you had many years ago Perfect it, brush it up, make it brighter, make it deeper, make it higher, make it more glorious. 
improve on it, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Because it tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, of course, but unto holiness. We can tell every babe in Christ, God has not called you babe in Christ unto uncleanness, unto carnality, unto carelessness, unto backsliding, unto excuse making, unto compromise. He has called you babe unto holiness. We can tell every young man in Christ, every young woman in Christ, God has not called you unto uncleanness, unto defilement, unto secret sin, unto fleshly activity, unto carnality. He has called you unto holiness. If we can tell the babes, if he can tell the growing ones, he has not called us unto uncleanness, how much more the minister, how much more the ministering man, the ministering woman, how much more the shepherd, how much more the pastor, how much more the overseer, how much more the wife of the overseer. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, unto ungodliness, unto frivolity, unto carelessness, unto carnality, but he has called us unto holiness. And that's why we overcome every time. We're overcoming the world through holiness. And then number three now, as we overcome and there is holiness, we are also occupied in the work of the highest, in the work of the highest. We're occupied in the work of the highest. Put it another way. We're occupied in the highest work for the Holy One. There's the highest work we can do. And you know, we've got testimonies from our brothers and sisters about you, about me too. When we were working in the institutions in the world, myself as a teacher, I did the very best. I don't want to tell you stories today. There's no time. But I look back to my days in working in the secular field. It was the very best. And all my students, those who get in touch with me today, they still testify. It was, I enjoyed it. I offered the very best. You can tell you are a nurse, and you are a medical doctor, and you are an engineer, and you are a community worker and you did your very best you left a mark behind that you did it to the very high level and the people that came after you are still trying to match the standard you left uh-huh now we come to the work of the highest and this is the highest work we can do you know as we're faithful more than we're faithful and more than we did the work in our secular employment and more than we're doing the work in our secular employment that we are making a mark and people know that we are stars there and that we shine forth and we're doing the very best in the kingdom of God now we occupy in the work of the highest with the highest devotion and with the highest consecration and with the highest commitment look at uh, what it says in Luke chapter 1 we're looking at Luke chapter 1 verse 7 to 6 it says and thou our child shall be the prophet of the highest. Remember, you are the prophet of the highest, the proclaimer of the highest, and you are the preacher for the highest, you are the pastor for the highest, you are the servant of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. Verse 77, it says that to give the knowledge of salvation. That's what we're to be occupied in, and we're doing this work for the highest. And it says that we shall give the knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. It tells us in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come to seek that which was lost. 
us and he has given us an example and he has given us a pattern all this heart was into it all this gift was into it all this wisdom was into it look at the way he approached the uh, single people like that woman at the well all the wisdom and all the all the sacrifice everything he ought to do he did but the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost the same way we do that now we follow after the pattern of christ look at verse 13 in verse 13 it says and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them occupy till I come occupy till I come underline those four words occupy till I come occupy till I come he has not come occupy till I come number one occupy till I come for you I'll be coming to take you and because I'm coming to take you, I'll be looking at your occupation. I'll be looking at your devotedness. I'll be looking at the way you are continuing in the work, occupy in my work like I did. And you do that until I come. Look at that. That does not give allowance for retirement from preaching, retirement from evangelizing retirement and release from harvesting and from being occupied at the work of the lord in saving souls and doing the work of the highest and the work of the harvest occupy till i come that word till does not allow a kind of suspension it does not allow a kind of break it's talking about continuity occupy until occupy till are you, are you breaking your service i'm tired today you're not tired it's just your thought i'm down today you're not down it's just your thought i'm weak today you are not weak let the weak say i am strong occupy till i come occupy till i Christ your Lord till he comes. Not until temptation comes, until trial comes, until persecution comes, until misunderstanding comes. And because of this misunderstanding, look at what he said about me. And look at what he did to me. Look at the way the attach me and look at what happened and therefore i cannot occupy now you miss one point there not occupy till that problem comes but occupy till i come it's coming to you and it will come when it's your time when you've done your work and you have labored to the last point and you've saved the last one you are supposed to save, it will come for you. It might come for you individually that it takes you home. Or it might come for you when it comes in the rapture for everybody. But until he comes, go on. And then he says, occupy till I come. Behold, I come quickly. It will not be long. The trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise, and then he that is to come will come and will not tarry until that time, brother, until that time, sister. Keep on, keep on, keep on doing the work of God, and great will be your reward in Jesus' name. He that overcometh and keepeth my work until the very end, you will not suffer the second death. Life, life in abundance life life eternal life life everlasting life the very life of christ will be you and will be for you for all eternity the lord has taught us a lot today and he wants us to take that to the lord in prayer why don't you rise up brother why don't you rise up sister i know you are still writing some things there but you know we can rise up now and then we take it to the lord in prayer and you know brother you know sister 
uh, we don't have enough time to really pray and really pray and we must uh, you know after we have closed after we have rounded up everything uh, you can still take this to the lord in prayer and say lord i thank you for the revelation today i thank you for all that you have taught me today and I, you take it back to the lord again in prayer the lord is reminding us tell the lord my service will be purposeful my service will be prayerful my service will be pure my service will be prayerful my service will be peaceful my service will be productive and then i'll be persevering in the things of the lord whatever persecution remember the lord will moderate the persecution don't concentrate on persecution concentrate on the purpose of your calling Consecrate on the power you have, the privilege you have in prayer. Concentrate on the peace you ought to have. And you ought to be a peacemaker too. Between husband and wife, a peacemaker. Between parents and children, a peacemaker. In your community, a peacemaker. And as a peacemaker between the holy God and the sinful man, you are reconciling men unto God. Concentrate on that. Concentrate on the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. And the Lord will make you that overcomer that does the work of the Lord until the very end. Remember your foundation, the foundation and the fortress of commissioned servants is a foundation. It's the first and the last. Let him be the first in your life and the last in your life. When you seek the first that you contact, the last that you contact, when you have a problem, is the eternal one, is the foundation. You are built on that foundation. Lord, help me to remain, to abide on that foundation. And then is the fortress, is your liberator, and is without equal. And then you understand. He wants you to be fearless, not in your strength. Maybe you say, I'm naturally a timid person. I'm naturally a fearful person. And now change the gear and move from being the natural person to the supernatural person. Let him live strong in you. And by the grace of God, you will not fear any of these things. He will support you. He will stand by you. And nothing of the past that you used to fear will overcome you. And then he'll make you faithful. He'll make you faithful in everything. He'll give you the grace to be faithful. And then you will be an overcomer. Brother, I am an overcomer. Sister, say that. I am an overcomer. And then I have ears to hear. And then what the Lord has given me, has taught me, I am going to obey one day at a time. My brother, one day at a time, you'll be victorious in Jesus' name. Holiness will be the very center of your life and the very center of your ministry. And you'll keep on in the work of the Lord. You'll occupy until he comes. Amen. Father, we thank you today for your word and we bless your name for the teaching we have received. We pray that you translate everything into our heart, into our life, into our ministry, into all our activities that will become a pattern of good sacrificial service and then we will walk to your satisfaction in Jesus' name. Strengthen every brother, strengthen every sister, make every one brother Brother, sister, young and old, overcome us in Jesus' name. And you said we will not be hurt at the second death. We pray, Lord, that eternal separation from God will not be ours in any way in Jesus' name. A untimely death will not come to us. And the premature death will not come to us. Eternal death will not come to us. The second death will not come to us. Preserve and protect all your people. Lord, you are still the miracle worker. What miracle in every life that those who are fearful will be fearless now and those who have been unfaithful in little things will be faithful now and those who have been dejected, they'll rise up and shake up the doors and become strong in the Lord in Jesus' name. And we pray that the power, the strength, 
the grace, the abiding spirit to continue faithfully in the work of the Lord, your grant unto everyone. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Brother, sister, you say, Amen. Amen. God bless you.